Good evening, welcome to LCT 7074 and the D-Day story. Uh, so tonight we're, you're, watch, you're watching us live maybe, or maybe you're watching us um, later on, but welcome either way. So what we're going to be uh, doing is having a bit of a look at the LCT, which you can see behind me, um, but then also meeting some of our staff. Um, I'm Andrew Whitmarsh, I'm the curator of the museum, and you'll be meeting some of our other staff, uh, uh, both staff and volunteers in fact, who help run the LCT. And um, also looking, talking, looking at and talking about some of our collections that relate to landing craft, um, but that aren't normally on display. Um, before we start, I just want to um, ha um, acknowledge the National Museum of the Royal Navy, who own LCT 7074 and uh, played the, the leading role in saving it and restoring it. So all credit to, to the National Museum of the Royal Navy. Um, and as we're going through, if you've got any questions or comments, um, do, um, do um, put them in because we'll try and answer them as we go along. Um, just to mention one thing that we, um, you might be wondering, so you can see LCT 7074 on the bow here. Um, H stands for H Squadron, so there were um, a number of flotillas in a squadron. 17 is 17 flotilla, which was the particular flotilla um, this, uh, this particular LCT was in on D-Day. And so we'll talk a bit more about its history in just a moment, but I'm now going to walk out of shot because the next thing that you'll be seeing is the, the ramp, the bow door, uh, coming down in just a moment. So the ramp is a really important feature um, of the landing craft. Obviously, a norm with a normal ship, if you have a, to, to actually unload from a normal ship, you'd have to um, hoist um, the vehicles or supplies, for example, out of the hold, and that's quite a long, drawn-out process. So it makes it quite hard to, and a slow process to unload. But with a landing craft, obviously, you want to be able to unload as quickly as possible because you're doing that on a, an enemy defended beach so that you want to be exposed to dangerous as or the the dangerous moment of leaving the landing craft for as short a time as possible so that's why there's the ramp so you can come off the landing craft get onto the beach and then go where, wherever you need to go um, as you can maybe hear in the background there's a this now we've got an electric motor powering the ramp but originally, this landing craft would have, um, wouldn't have had an electric motor powering the ramp. It was, um, it was powered manually. So um, lowering it like this was fairly easy because obviously it's a, a big lump of heavy metal, so it would just come on down under its own weight. So you just have, you'd be, the problem would be slowing it, um, opening more than anything else. But getting it back up again. So if you're on a, on a beach and you were being shot at, um, the way they'd get it up would be either side of the of the ramp there was a, a manual winch and you'd have had several sailors on that um, put, really putting their back into it with the added incentive of when they got the ramp up it would have given them a, a bit of protection um, and they'd have just just been raising it as, as, as fast um, and as, as quickly as they could and probably swearing quite a lot as well I imagine um, so now you're just starting to see over the top of the ramp into the LCT, into LCT 7074, and um, you can see our two tanks, there's a Sherman and a Churchill tank, the Sherman in the foreground, and in uh, a little bit, just a moment, we'll talk about those. Um, if you've um, already visited the LCT, um, do let us know what you thought of it, and if you haven't visited, um, what are your initial thoughts when you, when you see it like this? Um, and as I said a bit earlier, if you've got any comments or questions, do um, let, let us um, have them, because that would be, be nice to have, and we'll try and answer some of those. Uh, coming back to the ramp, there were some cases where after um, landing craft had landed on, on D-Day, they couldn't, the crews couldn't actually get the ramp back up, for example, because it was damaged. So they actually had to um, come back across the channel with the ramp still down, and you can imagine what that would have been like with the sea flooding in and... Um, Basically, the landing craft would have been half submerged as it was coming across. So in just a moment now, we're going to go on board. And as I mentioned, the sort of format, what we're doing, we're having a, a bit of a look around the LCT as we go. Not a systematic tour, but looking at some of the different aspects of the landing craft. Uh, and also meeting a couple of our teams, some of our staff and volunteers um, who uh, run the landing craft day to day, open it to the public. Um, and also looking at some of our collections that are related to landing craft um, in different ways and um, we'll have a, a closer look and talk about some of those. So now we're going on board.
So, um, hi, this, this is Dan. Um, Dan, do you want to just explain a bit about what your role is in, uh, on the yeah, LCT? Yeah, of course. So, I'm one of the um, LCT coordinators who work at the museum. So, essentially, I'm involved um, in charge of the day-to-day -day operation on the ship, which involves sort of general maintenance, open and closing every day, um, and also managing a sort of diverse team of uh, staff and volunteers on board as well. And what reaction do visitors have when they come on board? The first thing they usually think is um, they can't believe how big it is, because they're usually used to seeing the um, sort of uh, smaller um, landing craft that's featured in films like Saving Private Ryan, for example. And um, I, 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 so often when I mention the LCT to people away from here, when if I've gone out to meet to you know, do, do a talk or something like that, and people say they've seen it, and they say, yeah, it's just couldn't believe how big it was. It's really funny. It's just virtually 99% of people seem to say that. Yeah, because people, um, obviously they know they have to get the soldiers across, Normally, but sometimes they forget about the vehicles, and obviously, due to the size of the tanks and the, just the sheer weight of them, they have to have much bigger vessels like this one, um, which would have had 10 tanks on board uh, during D-Day, so it needs to be substantial. And also, I guess, the fact is that this is the only surviving LCT that was there on D-Day, and there's only a couple of other ones in the world, so this is almost unique, and certainly in terms of LCTs that were there on D-Day, it's unique. So it's not like, uh, you can see some other small landing craft in other museums, but um, some over in Normandy and other places, for example. But in terms of LCTs, this is the only place where you can see an LCT that was actually there on, on D-Day, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. Um, so any, any other sort of reactions or comments that people have when they visit? People are um, really complimentary of how um, it's been um, restored. So that was done by the National Museum of the Royal Navy. Um, people are sort of astounded because they look in the engine room where we have um, various pictures of what it was like um, when it was all rusted and kind of left, it, uh, left um, just to rot, essentially. But obviously, it was brought back up and um, restored, and people can't believe how, how well it's been restored. So that's quite the re an often reception we get. Mm. And we've had quite a few vis uh, veterans visit, haven't we, over the yeah, so, time to um, Accommodating veterans is uh, um, of key importance to the museum. Um, we just like to make sure they feel as welcome as possible. Um, the LCT in particular, obviously, is it's a war survivor, D-Day survivor itself. So the fact that they get to come on and sort of maybe sort of re-experience um, the feeling of being one of these vessels is quite emotional for them. And we want to make that as um, smooth as possible, really. Recently, about a couple of months ago, we had a group of five veterans come on board and a couple of volunteers took them around and they seemed to have a really good time. So it's definitely something we, uh, we welcome and get quite often on board as well. Yeah, I can't really imagine what it must be like for a, an LCT veteran to have been so familiar with these craft yeah. and then not have seen one for 80 or so years and presumably thought, never thought to see one again. And then, yeah, then they, they come, come back here and, and, and actually see an LCT again. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. Also, so it's the, the whole restoration project by the... National Museum of the Royal Navy has presented that opportunity to these veterans and obviously the wider public and it's just really, really great to see and they've done, again, they've done an amazing job. And just to mention a little bit more about the history, so you mentioned about carrying 10 tanks on D-Day and one of the great things about this LCT is that we know so much about its history, so it's not just any old landing craft, we know a lot about its history. So starting back at the start of 1944 when it was built by Hawthorne Leslie uh, on the Tyne, so a, a, a warship builder on the Tyne, and it was one of a group of six LCTs built there. Um, and then before too long, the crew had a, they had a bit of training. Before too long, it was the time for D-Day, so they loaded their tanks at Felixstowe. That was tanks of 7th Farm and Division. And as you said, there were 10 of them. So we've got our two tanks on here now, so it gives you a bit of an impression of what it was like. But it would have been completely full with, um, not just with the 10 tanks, but with 45 or so troops. So it would have been really chock full, and for several days. So they would have been on board for for quite a long time. Um, and then after D-Day, going back and forwards, carrying more troops across the channel lots of times. Uh, and then it has this, this post-war, post-World War II history where it's a nightclub in Liverpool for quite a few decades. Well, really, from it's a club and then a, a nightclub from the 1948-ish until the 1990s. And what, what, what do people make of the nightclub connection, do you think, the nightclub part of its uh, history? They're quite shocked. Um, a lot of the time they're quite shocked and it kind of sort of just Sort of, um, that does definitely wows them. Um, again, recently we had the the, the sons of the um, nightclub owners who came on board for one of our events, and I think that might have even been the first time they would have seen it um, ever since it was a nightclub. So that must have been amazing for them. But yeah, the general visitors, some of them can't believe that that is a nightclub. But 
it's, it's a fact that Drury, probably the fact that it was a nightclub is why we're standing on it today, essentially, because it had a post-war life mm. rather than sort of being changed in something else it, like, and sort of being forgotten about it. It survived because it had a, a different function and that yeah, is why, kind of why we're standing on it today, I think. Yeah, yeah so it's, in, it's, not, it's an integral part of the LCT's history. Yeah, so it's yeah. not a kind of sort of add-on or anything by any means. And just to explain for that period when it was a nightclub, the, um, the tank deck, the space here, was all um, was decked over, so this this was a covered space, and there were other rooms on top, so that was why they had a, a bit of space. Um, so, any, um, just to say again, if you've, anyone's got any questions or comments, um, do let us know, and I think we might have one now. I've got one thing. How roughly long did it take for the mining park to be refurbished? Okay, so the question was, how long did it take for the LCT to be refurbished? Um, so, the, the LC, uh, LCT seven oh seven four came down here in twenty fourteen, and then. Uh, then it was 2020 when it arrived, so well, sorry, came down to Portsmouth and it was in the naval base um, being restored by the National Museum of the Royal Navy and then it arrived here in 2020. So the, I, I don't think the restoration process was carrying on a kind of steady pace throughout that because once it was, the LCT was down in Portsmouth, the next stage was to find funding to do that second phase of the project to do the sort of more extensive restoration. But it was a really long, complicated project and moving it here as well um, so, so were, were you here did you see it I wasn't it was... I, I didn't see it happen um, there's a video of it in the mm. engine room so I've watched that quite a few times so essentially it was taken from the dockyard which is situated sort of in that sort of direction it was put on a, a barge and moved across to the seafront just just as behind just over there and then it was sort of transferred onto these electric dollies which are essentially these wheels that can rotate and it was one man sort of controlling it pushing it all the way along the seafront, um, sort of controlling, moving all the way along the seafront. And then this canopy, which you see above, um, is, was already here. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of had to, the wheels had to spin. It had like these, I think it was, like, I don't remember exactly the unit that took it across, but it was moved sideways into the space. And am I right in saying it was left kind of halfway in and out so they could crane the, the tanks on board as well? Yeah, I think so. There was a, a system of rails for moving it yeah. into position. But yeah, before that, because of the canopy, uh, on when it was on the road, next just next to here, they had to crane the, the two tanks on, um, and um, they, then move it into the final position. Um, right, thanks very much, Dan. We'll tank, talk you of tanks. Let's move on to the Sherman tank. Um, Thank you, Andrew. And so these two, the two tanks that are on board the LCT used to be outside the D-Day Museum, as we used to be. So we were renamed in 2018 as the D-Day Story. Uh, so this one is a Sherman Grizzly. So you might well know the Shermans are really common. Uh, U.S. tank, well, one probably the most common U.S. tank of the Second World War, but the, being a Sherman Grizzly means that it was um, built in Canada, but actually some of the actual individual components have markings on them, so we know they were made in America, but the whole tank was, 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 was built in Canada. Um, and we don't know the history of this tank, but if we can have a closer look at some of the, the markings on the front, starting with this... Um, the, the desert rat at the top left there. So as I mentioned, um, the tanks that are on board were belong to the 7th Armoured Division. So the, the desert rat symbol up the top there, that belongs to the, um, or was the, the, the markings of the 7th Armoured Division who'd served in North Africa, hence the, the desert rat nickname that they had. And then just below that, uh, the 76th on the red and blue square, that indicates that it's the 2nd Royal Artillery Regiment in the division. And then off to the right, there's an X on a red and blue square. Um, so the X means it's the battery commander's tank. And this, so it's in the markings of Major Dennis Wells, who commanded K Battery of 5th Royal Horse Artillery. Um, and then the other, co the, the other colors there um, means it's the 2nd Battery within, within the regiment. And so we didn't just make these up. There's actually a photograph um, of this, this particular tank, or the tank that this depicts, I should say, that. Um, was uh, in Normandy um, at a place called Villa Bocage about a week after D-Day where it got knocked out in a, a battle with the Germans, which the 7th Armoured Division definitely came off worse out of. Um, so that tank is actually there, and that was one that um, Stephen Fisher, who's the historian and archaeologist for the project, found. Um, and the way of knowing that that particular tank, depicted in that photograph that this tank rep represents, knowing that it, it was a tank that was on this very LCT, relates to this number here. So you can see, if you have a, a closer look, uh, so 3517, that's what was the, the, known as the landing table index number. Basically, it's the number for um, the 
a landing craft that was going to carry the load of troops that this one did. So they, the, the actual landing craft they used might have changed at the last minute. So they didn't use the LCT number, um, and that was, that was um, why they used that number. But in the photograph, you can still see that number, uh, and that's um, how we knew that, as I said, this, the tank that this one depicts was actually on this very landing craft. I'll now walk uh, further back to the rear of the LCT, and we'll just have a look at our Churchill tank. So this is a Churchill crocodile, um, and uh, so not associated with LCT 7074, although it, there's a good chance it, that this LCT might have carried Churchill tanks later on in the Battle of Normandy. Um, so this is a Churchill crocodile, so it's a, a, a version of the Churchill tank. So it's a British tank, unlike the Sherman, which is a, a US tank. Uh, British tank, and it has uh, the crocodile means that it had a flamethrower. So this on the front here was actually the flamethrower, so it could project uh, a burning fuel um, out from the front of it, and it was a really terrifying weapon. So it couldn't, not very far, it couldn't, it couldn't fire very far, but it could do um, an awful lot of damage and was a, a really scary weapon. Um, and then just to, to mention the markings on the front, uh, so this, this tank depicts... Um, a tank of C Squadron 141st Regiment Royal Armoured Corps, um, and, and it's a tank that was um, commanded by Lieutenant John Shearman. And the reason that we um, picked that, that particular tank was that he later won the military cross, and we have that military cross in our museum now. It's kindly donated to us. So the, the sort of double triangle symbol that you can see on the, <clears throat> the right there, um, that... Um, is the markings for 31st Tank Brigade, which was the sort of parent formation for this, for, for 141st Regiment RAC. And then on the left, you've got the, um, the, the badge that represented the, that particular regiment uh, on the left. And then the yellow um, disc with 40 in it, that's for um, basically informing people of the weight of the tank so that, that, that um, they knew what kind of category of bridge it was safe for the tank to cross, so it wouldn't fall through the bridge. So now, moving on, We'll go uh, further to the back of the LCT. Uh, and the space that we're now going into was the engine room. So the LCT used to have two engines, uh, two, uh, two actually petrol engines, um, and they were just in this space here. And now we'll meet uh, another one of our team. So hi, Tammy. Um, do you want to say something about what you do here? Of course. I'm an LCT navigator and a kickstart, which means I'm part of a government-funded scheme to kickstart people's careers. I've got a report from the commanding officer of the LCT 922 and a photo of Alan Thompson, who was second in command. Yeah, so like this LCT, there would have been two officers on board, so he was the, the second in command. Um, and the report here, this was, a, so as I mentioned earlier, from our collections, um, and you're going to, I think, read us a, a bit of an extract from it just to um, explain a bit more about what happened on B-Day. Yep, it reads, I immediately pulled out to port and steered for a small gap which I could see in the centre of the beach. Like the remainder of the beaches, it was obstructed with stranded LCTs, minor landing craft and drowned vehicles. These I managed to avoid and beach successfully, pro proceeding to disembark my load. After waiting 15 minutes with no sign of casualties or even their possible arrival, I gave the order up door and proceeded to unbeach. And so that's just to explain that bit um, to everyone. So they've been asked to um, wait on the beach for some uh, um, casualties to be brought out so they could take them back to the UK, but they didn't want us to stay on the beach for too long because there's a risk that the landing craft would get left high and dry. So they, after 15 minutes, they decided oh, it was time to head back to the UK. Exactly. In the next paragraph, it mentions kedging off. Kedging off is when an LCT is pulling into the beach, it would drop the anchor to then use when they needed to leave. They'd use it by pulling themselves off. Um, it says, we had kedged off about 30 yards when we heard something grating underneath us. I took it to be a drowned vehicle as I had seen no sign of beach obstructions there, these being covered by high water at the time. I ordered full a stand together and felt the ship grating over the obstruction for about a minute. And so just to explain full stern together, so as I mentioned, it had uh, two engines that they could go at different speeds or indeed in different directions to help them turn, but on this occasion, 
they just wanted to get off the beach as fast as possible. So both their engines are going astern, as well as, as you mentioned, the anchor being used to, to kedge them off. But this, where it says um, there's this ship grating over the obstruction for about a minute, and um, this is an official report, so it's meant, you know, normally it's fairly kind of dry, but this really makes me imagine a bit, Motley, it must have been like being in this LCT, hearing this horrific noise, there's something on the under, uh, that's scraping over the, 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 on the underside, and just hoping that you would get clear and, and get free, but, well, you'll tell us what happened next. It then says, suddenly there was a loud explosion and we came to a sudden stop as mines burst through the fuel tanks and the engine room bulkhead. Having checked for casualties and found all personnel all right, except for the odd bruises, I inspected the damage and found that we had settled on the bottom with the engine room flooded the fuel, with fuel oil, so decided to wait for low water before attempting any repairs when the craft would be dried out. So we're in the engine room now. So basically saying this space is half flooded with the, the oil, the fuel oil they'd have used to, to power it. Exactly. And because of that, it would have meant that they needed to be towed back through the English Channel. It then goes on to say, on the morning of t- June 12th, LCT 737 secured alongside and completed the tow to Fort Gilliger, Portsmouth, where we were reported to Truco and were instructed to secure a buoy. This was done with assistance of 737, who moored alongside us. The following day, June 13th, it was noticed that we were slowly settling in spite of pumping operations. A signal was flashed ashore to the effect that we were sinking. LCT 737 was once again directed to our assistance and took us in tow to Strokes Bay, where we were successfully beached portside too. So why did you particularly, I think I probably know the answer, but why, why did you pick this um, document in particular? Because it shows one cruise of an LCT, their journey back. It was getting home, being able to. It wasn't that easy. <laughs> and yeah, it's just amazing, isn't it? Because just to sort of recap, so they, they, they were there quite early on D-Day. So I think it was three and a half hours after the first troops landed, they, they started landing their troops. Um, which were um, vehicles of the Durham Light Infantry, if I remember rightly. Um, so it's 6th of June that they land, they, they get to Normandy, and then it's the 12th of June before they get back. And then the next day they realise they're actually sinking. So what they must have gone... You, you, it's really hard to imagine, isn't it? Exactly. What, but fortunately the, they've written a report that gives us quite a, a good idea. Mm-hmm. Um, so just to, that makes me think, are there any questions or comments that, that people have? Here, just a comment from um, someone called Matt saying, thank you for this. My dad was a stoker on an LCT. Oh, that's great. So that was a comment from Matt, just in case it wasn't picked up by the mic. Um, his father was a stoker on LCT. So we get a lot of um, family members of uh, LCT veterans visiting as well. So sometimes the, uh, the veteran's no longer with us, but the, uh, I know the families get a lot out of visiting. You've probably met some. Yeah, I have. Over, it's over the months. very nice to see. <laughs> Um, well, thanks very much, Tammy. Um, we'll just have a quick look um, at the, the rear of this space as we go out. So, normally, in, when the LCT was original, you wouldn't be able to see through this. Uh, there was a, a, a bulkhead between the engine room and this space. But what we're now looking into um, was the, um, the cruise mess, the where the crew would sleep and eat. So you can see the table that's set out as if they were um, um, Having, having dinner. The pigeon um, wouldn't have been there, so that's a, a soft toy of representing Gustav the pigeon who flew back um, on D-Day bringing news, the first news of um, D-Day back to the UK and um, uh, we have um, Gustav's medal, the Dickin medal, he was awarded the Animal BC uh, on display in, in our museum and the soft uh, toy is um, on sale in our shop. And so on, on, after that commercial plug we'll carry on moving to the upper levels of the LCT. Um, and if you haven't already visited the LCT, this hopefully might uh, encourage you to come along and see us down here in Portsmouth. Um, so we're open seven days a week um, and pretty much every day of the year. So check out our website, which is thedaystory.com, um, if you want to know more. <clears throat> so we're now on the <clears throat> upper parts of the LCT. Um, <clears throat> And just to quickly mention about what you can see here. So this is the wheelhouse and above is the bridge. And between these two uh, and the engine room where we were just now, that was how the engine, the, the, sorry, the LCT was controlled and steered. So on the bridge, you'd have one of the two officers. So there are 12 crew, two officers. And the, the, one of the two officers would be, up, would be up there on the bridge. 
there was a voice pipe, which, as it suggests, is simply a pipe that you shout down um, that comes out into the wheelhouse here. And here, one of the sailors, um, often the coxswain, who is the, the, the sort of lead steering person, but they'd, other sailors would also take turns, would be in here, and he'd hear the instructions uh, from the, the officer up above, and then he then in turn, so he would make corrections on the wheel, course corrections, we'll be in there in just a moment and see that. And then he would signal down with the engine room telegraph down to where we just were in the engine room um, if, to um, signal changes in speed of, and direction of the engine. So that was how it all, all worked. So now we're going to go into the wheelhouse and meet another one of the team. So, Catherine, um, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and explain um, what your role here is? Yes, I'm one of the volunteers on the landing craft, and our role is to tell the story of LCT 7074. Um, we give guided tours if they're booked, and also we'll look after your health and safety while you're on board. And we couldn't open the LCT without you. That's not an yeah. exaggeration. Um, without you and the volunteers, yeah. because um, we haven't got enough staff to run it all, and so we, we, the LCT team is really essential, isn't it, yes. to, yeah. to just, well, to, just to open up to the public. And it's, it's a great role as well. It's, it's, it's not just essential, it's, it's very, very enjoyable. And you meet so many people, and they've all got a story. Um, whether it's a neighbour or a grandparent, everybody's got a connection in some way to this and, story. And actually, talking of connections, you've got a, a, yes, a, we do. a family I, I, connection my to family, Langdon Craft, don't you? Yeah, we had a family boatyard in Chichester Harbour, and they built Langdon Craft during the war. They built infantry Langdon Craft. And we had an old landing craft which we used as a jetty. And I remember sitting on that with one of the old ladies who's part of the family who'd built it during the war. And she told me that, that, that the whole family had had to pitch in and she'd been given a bag of nails and told to bang them in. And she remembers hearing that the landings had started and thinking very much of the craft that she'd built and what those men were going through. And in the back of her mind, she was thinking that if I could tap a nail through that, it's not going to stop. A bullet, and she prayed very hard for those men on that landing craft. So it's a very personal connection. Mm. So, mm. Yeah. Um, and so, do you want to? We've, again, we've um, like just like with Tammy just now, you've um, picked an object from our collection. So, do you want to explain a bit well, more? Well, I've about actually it? chosen a very personal object. It's a pocket Bible belonging to John Dunlop, who is a Royal Navy um, chap on the beach on so Sword a, Beach. A photograph of him on on the right there with one of his. Right. So he was actually based ashore, which is slightly unusual for Navy, um, and he was part of a small group that were um, manning the Royal Naval Ferry Service on Sword Beach. Yeah, and I think people often don't realise that there were sailors ashore, though, and it's yeah. natural you assume that sailors are always afloat. But so he was part, his particular unit was Naval Party 1569, um, and they were part of the, they were, they were the, the, the unit at Sword Beach that was controlling the ferry service. So there's people know, or more likely perhaps, to know about the, um, sh the ships and landing craft mm. going back and forwards across mm. the channel like this one. But then the, f the ferry service was actually LCTs and other craft that stayed in Normandy and went out a few miles off the coast out to a, sh to a ship, um, unloaded the troops or vehicles or whatever from that, brought it to the coast. So they were going that short distance and they were staying um, off the coast of Normandy. And so he was part of the unit that was actually controlling them and each day figuring out how many, who, what have we got to unload and how many landing craft we've got available and so on. Yeah, and um, so this is his pocket Bible. Um, and the first thing we noticed about it is it's got a lovely curve which tells us it went everywhere with him. It was in his pocket. Um, it's taken on the shape of whichever part of him the pocket was. We think they were, they were, they were on the chest. And if you look inside the very, very front, you've got the standard message from King George that all the Bibles had. We can see this one's from the National Bible Society of Scotland, and that it was given to him by a friend who was the Reverend Hughes. And that must have meant something to him to have that with him. But more interestingly about this Bible is that he used this blank pages at the back as a very personal diary. And as you can see, it starts on the night before but the first entry is June the 6th, and there's just one word. It says, on the beaches at France, hell. And it must have been. 
And, then and, on, and he, clearly he felt, yeah. you know, that, that sort of summed it up for him, I guess. He didn't, almost didn't want to write anymore. And just to be clear about where it says Monday, Tuesday, it very definitely doesn't mean he was there on the 5th no. of June. So Tuesday was the 6th, but as you say, presumably it's because he set off on the 5th. Yes. And it was, yeah. so that was the two-day process to, to get there, maybe. And then on the next day, on Wednesday the 7th, he's put, they were gunned at 1.30, the ammo dump went up at 4, and they were being shelled and five people were killed. It, it wasn't a safe place to be on that beach at all. Yeah, and we've actually got a photograph here, also from a collection, so not related to him, but um, from another source. So this must be what he was talking about. So this is Sword Beach. It was actually on the 8th of June, um, but you could forgive him for getting his days slightly mixed up. Um, and you can see the massive clouds of black smoke uh, sort of boiling up above the, the, sea, the beach, the houses along the beachfront. And what happened was there was a um, petrol dump that was set alight by an air, a single German aircraft flew over and dropped a single bomb which set alight this petrol dump that then set alight um, an ammunition store and ammunition started exploding. Um, so it was a, a really dangerous situation, just destroyed quite a lot of supplies as well as people being um, killed and injured. But as you say, you, you kind of... You maybe kind of assume that so D-Day was clearly very dangerous, but then it's, it kind, of, it's kind of natural mm. to think you might think that okay, then the the, the danger moves mm. inland as the troops advance, and the beach then becomes a bit safer. But as that's not on this as it shows, it clearly not safe. We, not, not we go then to the twenty fifth of June, and that's nearly three weeks later, and he's still being shelled. If you see that entry there, and it put shelled all day, it hit cruisers, tankers coasters with ammo, and then at midnight, mortar fire, and that's nearly three weeks after D-Day. And I, th I believe they had to shut Sword Beach. Yes, yeah, so I think it was on the 1st of July they actually shut it completely, but they'd sort of scaled back a bit <clears throat> the landings, and the reason being that the, because um, you, you might think, well, what, how can the Germans still shell Sword Beach, but because it's quite, um, uh, the, the Germans were actually relatively close um, to the uh, east, um, so they were still able to, to the area where the hours hadn't landed, so they were still able to, to um, shell from the beach from that direction. Um, so do we have any more questions or comments? Yeah, we've got a couple. Phil is asking if the crew accommodation was much more cramped than it looks today. <clears throat> um, so you probably got a flavour, so the question was, was, was the, uh, about the crew accommodation, whether it was more cramped than it looks. So the first thing to mention is um, where we, we, we were standing in the engine room, and then uh, just in front of where the table was that you could see, that was, there was a bulkhead there. So it was basically the back of that room. Um, and it, it, it was, but it was a really cramped space. So you had a, there was an electric motor in there for the, uh, operating the winch that was just above. And obviously you had the, net, the, the engines, the main landing craft engines um, next door as well. So it was quite a noisy space. <clears throat> um, but the, yeah, you had, so you had, um, hammocks for, for several men who'd be sleeping there and then lockers for example to, for them to keep their, their kit and the tables and so it definitely wasn't um, was quite cramped and was pretty uncomfortable and the landing craft crews actually got extra pay to recognize that they um, that it was the conditions were so primitive. We have another question from Emily who's asking if the bullet holes are real if they're put in during the refurbishment. <clears throat> Uh, so Emily's asking if the bullet holes are real or were put in during the refurbishment. So that's presumably some of the holes like these. Um, it, they're not actually bullet holes. We don't quite know what they're from, but they, we think they must, I guess, must have been added probably in the post-wartime, uh, post-World War II phase, when someone wanted to simply fit, fit something on here and they've drilled through. Um, this was actually armour, so it was probably quite a hard job drilling through it. Um, <clears throat> But when, so this LCT, LCT 7074, um, landed, ended up landing its troops on the 7th of June rather than on D-Day itself. So it was off the beaches, it was off Gold Beach on D-Day, on, late on D-Day. Um, it was never meant to land its troops early on D-Day. It was meant to, that the troops it, that it was carrying were part of the follow-up forces. So they were going to come along behind the initial troops who, who landed and seized the beaches and then sort of keep the momentum of the attack going. Um, but because things were running a bit late, they ended up landing on the 7th of June. So at that point, although um, it was sort of, uh, Gold Beach wouldn't have been completely safe, like we were just mm -hmm. talking about um, that for Sword Beach, but um, it, it wasn't in, there wasn't the danger of people actually shooting at you. So we don't we don't think that they're 
We've got a lovely levels. story from the number one on here. In his diary, it says that on the 7th of June, when they beached to do some repairs, that the villagers came down with some champagne and three or four crew members were allowed to go and have a glass of champagne with the villagers. And although that's a lovely story, it also tells you that actually you could walk around on that beach without snipers mm. and people in bunkers shooting well, at Also you. amazing that the civilians that close mm. in, in the middle of mm. a war zone. Yeah, something like that. Gosh, what they must have gone through. Do we have any other One more. Questions? Do you have a list of all LCTs and their activities on Matt? So Matt's saying, do we have a list of all LCTs and their activities? Um, not, not one that's quite as useful as it sounds like what you're hoping, but we do have some information about LCTs. So if you have a, a, a question about a particular LCT or something like that, um, do send an inquiry via our website um, or, or indeed via uh, social media potentially. Um, some, something that people sometimes ask is that um, uh, my relative was in a particular unit do you know which landing craft they're on? Um, and sometimes it's possible to give some idea. Basically, there isn't a, an easy source to look it up, but some, there's bits of information, so sometimes we can give some idea of what it might be. Okay, well, thanks very much, Catherine. And just to come back to what you started out by saying about how you enjoy volunteering, um, there's, uh, if, if you're listening to this and you're interested in volunteering, then do check out our website. There's more information on there. Definitely. Um, Thanks very much. So we're now going to walk through just to the, the rear um, of this space. So we're just passing by the commanding officer's cabin. So not exactly luxurious, but he had a slightly better situation than um, the rest of the crew. And then the next space um, is the galley, so where the food was prepared for the, uh, the crew. So again, pretty basic and small. And then um, I picked out this um, model of a landing craft. Um, so this might look a bit familiar if you remember what LCT 7074 looked from the side, because this started out as a Mark III landing craft like this one. But um, it's got all this, as you can see, this sort of extra uh, equipment set up on the deck here. So it's had an extra um, uh, deck fitted, and then it's got all this apparatus on here. So this represents uh, LCT R4. Three eight. That, so landing that stands for landing craft tank rocket, uh, and it was made by Roger Ward, who was serving on board that that particular landing craft um, at Gold Beach on D-Day. So, but basically, what these were equipped for is they had about a thousand rockets on here, which could be fired in groups of about twenty or so, in quick in fairly quick succession. And so, shortly before the first troops land on the beaches, they'd fire off all these rockets as a way of preparing the way for the troops. Uh, trying to explode mines and that kind of thing, um, and just to, it's a, a really nice model just to pick out a couple of features. So um, you've got at the back here, um, you've got the uh, it had a, a radar so that the um, LCT could fire its rockets accurately. Um, you couldn't individually; you, you had to you aimed the the rockets by aiming the craft. So, so that was really essential. Um, and this space uh, we're now in the, the equivalent of this space here, so that you can see the. Uh, the bridge up there, and, and we're and just above us where where we are now is these there's two anti-aircraft guns like the like the two here, and then here you can see this blast shield that was fitted, this sort of angled shield, um, and that was because the heat from the rockets or firing was, was so immense that the crew needed some protection. So basically, most all of the crew apart from the commanding officer, who would be sheltered on the bridge, everyone else would be in in um, in a more sheltered position. So it's a really nice model to. To illustrate that um, and we've got a photograph here of Roger Ward so he's here on the right um, and he wasn't actually in jail this is um, when the, um, he'd a bit earlier in the war he'd gone to the US um, to pick up uh, a different landing craft a landing craft infantry large um, so quite a lot of the, LC, the landing craft used on D-Day were made in the US and so it's quite common for Royal Navy crews like these guys here to go over there and pick up the landing craft sail it back to the UK. Um, so that was, but then, as I said, for D-Day itself, he was, he was serving uh, on this LCTR. Um, have we got any other questions or comments? Right, okay, let's just um, move to the vinyl um, part of, the, of what we're talking about. Um, so if, if you're still with us, sorry, I'll, I'll try and avoid the sun blinding you maybe. Um, so 
Um, thanks very much if you're, you've stuck with us through to here. Um, so we're just coming to the end of our, our live stream. I hope you've enjoyed uh, looking around LCT 7074 here at the D-Day Story in Portsmouth. Um, so if you haven't visited, do come and visit us. Our website's the D-Day Museum, sorry, the D-Day Story.com. Um, uh, so I want to thank um, all my colleagues who've uh, helped me with, with, this, um, with this live stream, who you've, you've seen and uh, seen on camera. Um, we want to thank the National Museum of the Royal Navy, who, as we mentioned earlier, um, own this landing craft and have lent it to us for display. Um, all of the objects that are featured in this, we'll, we'll, we'll put images of them on our social media fairly shortly. So if you not want to um, know more, just do have a look at those. Um, and um, and that's, uh, that's coming to the end then. So we're finishing off with a, a view out over South Sea Common here where um, on the days leading up to D-Day there would have been troops trekking across here to load up further down and then out to the other side, the Solent, um, where at the time of D-Day it would have been full of ships and landing craft that were all gathered out there. So that's, that's it from us here in Portsmouth. Um, thanks very much for watching and um, if you're interested, um, if this would be interesting, you do check out our website. Thanks very much.